and welcome to the Highlander Foundry Startup Showcase. We can't wait to show you what our student entrepreneurs have accomplished this summer. First off, I'm Kat Savalas, the Program Director of Entrepreneurship for the New Jersey Innovation Institute. My name is Will Lutz, and I'm the General Manager for Entrepreneurship at the New Jersey Innovation Institute and Co-Director of VentureLink at NJIT. We've been working closely with these teams as part of the Highlander Foundry, a three-month startup program for NJIT students and recent grads. We're in the second year of our program and you'll be hearing from six companies today. With small cohorts and hands-on workshops, we focus on topics such as communications and pitching, customer discovery and development, and MVP design. For many of these students, this is their first journey into entrepreneurship. And over the past three months, we've seen more than a few aha moments, coaching sessions, and pivots. We're so proud of how far all of these teams have come and the valuable entrepreneurial skills that they've learned in the process. Highlander Foundry is part of VentureLink at NGIT, a startup incubator and co-working space on NGIT's campus for both the university community and the public at large. VentureLink is the largest incubator in New Jersey and one of the largest in the United States. We have office space, co-working space, and wet lab space that is open to any and all entrepreneurs. We also run a number of community events, including workshops, guest speakers, and professional networking events. These are all open to the public and designed to foster the entrepreneurial ecosystem in the region. You can learn more at our website, VentureLink.org. VentureLink is part of the New Jersey Innovation Institute, a nonprofit created by and working in partnership with NJIT. Our mission is to further research, innovation, and entrepreneurship across the state of New Jersey. In addition to entrepreneurship, we have other areas such as defense and homeland security, healthcare, biopharma, data and tech, and professional education. NJII is the hub for innovation in New Jersey, and I recommend going to njii.com to learn more about some of our work. Before we get into the pitches, we owe a special thanks to our mentors and our supporters. They've shared their invaluable expertise and dedicated one-on-one -on -one time with our student entrepreneurs to really, truly make this program successful. All right, it's now time to enjoy the main event. Below this video, you will see that our founders are available for a live Q&A in the chat. Don't forget to register your YouTube account in order to participate. Okay, let's the showcase begin. Hey guys, my name's Brandon, and I'm here to tell you about Hover. Hover is a mobile platform that allows artists to bring their art to life in a whole new way. By leveraging augmented reality, artists and creators can easily add 3D and 2D assets to their work. So being profitable from art isn't as black and white as before. Galleries worldwide are facing a 40% revenue drop due to the coronavirus. Artists need a new way to draw in potential customers. And more and more, we can see this trend towards digital art. Take, for example, NFTs, which are digitally signed virtual pieces of art. They've seen a huge boom since the pandemic. Less and less do we see people physically going to view art, and more do we see these virtual options. Hover solves this problem by creating a novel way for artists to augment their art. With the Hover platform, artists can place a QR code on or near their works that when scanned, shows digital assets that can be viewed then in the augmented space. Not only does this breathe life into traditional art, but it also allows artists to showcase their non-2D art, such as sculptures, to use anywhere in the world. Now, let's show you a quick demonstration of the platform. Once logged in, first set a reference point for your QR code. This will serve as an orientation when other users view your work. Place down and move around any assets as you see fit. Once you are done, hit save. If you click the I in the bottom tab, you will be taken into viewer mode, where the registered QR code is now public.
Let's take a look at the augmented reality market in general. It was $17.6 billion in 2020, and major AR glasses haven't even hit mainstream yet. Revenue from mobile AR apps alone grossed $725 million in 2016. Hover, while targeting artists first, intends to pivot towards everyone as AR becomes more mainstream. Let's look at the revenue of a similar app for a 2D art creation style app called Canva. Last year, the company grossed $500 million in revenue. Um, as you can see, the AR space is increasing, increasing, and um, it's, it's intended to grow uh, like exponentially. Our business model is a month-to-month -month SaaS type subscription service. We intend to charge users for the amount of QR codes they store on the app. The enterprise app will have the ability to generate as many QR codes as the customer needs. We intend to flush out this tiered system more and more as we gain more traction, but to start off, we'll be using this model. Our strategy is to make Hover easily accessible to artists interested in having AR in their digital portfolios. We have found that a large market share of artists' portfolios are in Shopify, Wix, and Squarespace. Simple plugins that link to the Hover mobile app is a quick and easy way to capture some of this market. Another strategy we intend to do is go directly to museums and galleries, showcase our technology, and ask if they would be interested in potentially using it. Other artists who then go to this, these galleries who want the AR experience will download the Hover app and perhaps maybe even want to make AR experiences for their own art. Um, another potential uh, go-to-market strategy is the NFT market. Last year it hit, this year it hit 2.5 billion. Adding an easy way to display NFTs, which are by design virtual art, is a great use case for the app for a problem that hasn't had a solution yet. Artiv and Overly are two companies in the augmented reality art space. While both of them are good, they're not actually accessible to the average artist and require a couple steps to get things viewable and shareable, which includes registering and talking with the representative, with Hover, it's as simple as opening up art assets, laying them down, and then getting a QR code. Everything is done by the user, no waiting for someone to design an experience for you. These companies also have everything, including a demo locked behind a paywall. It's impossible to really understand augmented reality unless you can try and share it with your users. With extensive market research, we found that around 35% of artists would like to incorporate AR into their designs or experiment with augmented reality art in their portfolios. We now have an email list of potential future customers and have had a great idea of what is wanted from the platform. We are currently in the process of setting up demos with this, these customers, and I believe the knowledge we gained from this research has positioned us extremely, extremely well. So a little bit about ourselves. My name is Brandon. Uh, I'm an NGIT graduate and uh, I do the technical uh, lead. And then our co-founder Chandu is the UI UX designer and he's also an NGIT graduate. Hover, see the hidden world. If you guys have any questions, feel free to email us. Thank you. Hello, my name is Parth Yakumik and I'm the co-founder and CTO of Flow. Flow is building a consumer-first credit bureau that is disrupting the broken financial access system. Let me start by giving you a snippet of my personal experience. I had a decent credit history back in India, but when I moved to the United States eight months ago, I was denied a credit card. And to get a secure credit card, I had to pay a security deposit. Despite the fact that TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian are the largest credit bureaus in the United States as well as in India, my Indian credit history couldn't be used due to lack of international credit report translation. Can you believe it? About 6 million immigrants are denied access to credit due to lack of international credit history translation. 
let me tell you why this is bad for the US financial system. Because the US financial system doesn't recognize who is a good investment or a bad investment. This ends up hurting the immigrants who are transitioning to a new life. They end up feeling like second class citizens as they can only get secure credit cards or tiny credit limits, thus leading to taking loans from families or local creditors at an extremely high APR. Usually what today's immigrants borrowing process is that you apply to the lenders, the lenders then request the information from the major, major credit bureaus, and because the credit bureaus don't have any data of the candidates, the lenders end up rejecting the candidate. We at Flow translate foreign credit history to a US digestible credit score. We do that by giving a global credit report format, which is equivalent to a FICO score using trade lines and inquiry history and or a six-month US-based bank transaction history, and by providing education to the incoming international students to partnering up with the visa consultancies in the home country and hence bridging the educational gap. We, we got to know a lot from our customer discovery interview when we talked to our potential customers like the head of risk and compliance department of a mid-sized bank, fellow international students, and the visa consultancies back in the home country. We got to know the pain point and thought that this could turn into a big opportunity and solve a lot of problems. The major observation was that without proper data, there are ways for credit lenders to lend credit, but the amount of credit would necessarily not be the amount our users deserve. Hence, there will be a there will be a need for good credit data and can do wonders. What we also learned was, these, was that these financial institutions need data catered according to their own risk and compliance strategy. And there's definitely a need for importing international credit history data to the United States. Now we come to our target market. Our customers are upcoming local and rural banks who wants to expand internationally and wants to cater a new variety of users. A user, a user division would include incoming immigrants. Currently, the financial institutions in the United States are missing out on $400 billion lending opportunity. And out of that $400 billion, $200 billion is because of the lack of cross-border data. Approximately $20 billion revenue can be generated, which puts our serviceable obtainable market at $100 million, just for $1 billion worth of lending to approximately 100,000 international students out of the millions of international students coming every single year. We at Flow would like to expand the quantity of immigrants served by utilizing international credit history and the financial data to determine credit worthiness of the user in the United States. And having the right partners like the visa consultancies who can help educate the incoming students, generate leads, and help us bridge the educational gap and provide the key to unlock this gigantic untapped market of potential credit card users. We have a two-way revenue scheme. One is a fixed fee for every FICO equivalent credit score, which is a flow passport report. And second is an affiliated revenue where we earn from each qualified credit card holder. Our business model is actually quite simple. We don't charge a single penny to a user. We charge approximately $100 to the financial institution per $1,000 worth of lending. And for just providing the flow passport report, we charge $60 per person to the financial institutions. Last but not the least, we have an amazing team with an unfair advantage of us going through a startup procedure and being international students from India. My co-founder is an MBA student with a major in finance and I'm a computer science student at NJIT. And lastly, we are thankful to our awesome advisory board who for the whole time and each day help us with refining and converting our idea into a startup today. A huge shout out to our mentors, Bill, Chelsea and Kat. Thank you everyone and have an amazing day. Please let me know if you have any questions. We'll be happy to answer them all. everyone, today I'm here to speak to you all about our organization called Lyra. There are glaring, unaddressed educational disparities within the United States. The STEM field has some of the fastest growing careers, but also requires some of the highest levels of education and the highest standardized test scores. A lot of the time, high schoolers and underserved communities experience difficulty meeting these STEM career expectations, which causes them to be discouraged from pursuing these careers. Here's an example. There are 11.9 million children living in poverty in the United States. Of these children, less than 30% will attend college. Of that 30%, less than 50% will actually graduate college. 
Now, there's a lot of reasons for these statistics, but one huge reason is because these students have unequal access to education. In fact, the Department of Education itself states that low-income students have a 55% chance to go to a high school that offers advanced math, compared to 65% for the U.S. income average. Lyra was founded in Newark and is a student-led nonprofit to, that aims to bridge this gap. We provide programs in underserved communities to help students prep for STEM careers. We do this through both workshops and mentorships focusing on unconventional STEM, topics and experiences that can't be taught in a classroom or read in a textbook. In the past year, we've delivered our workshops to provide high school students information about unconventional STEM topics with the help of guest speakers, who augment our workshops and act as a network for high schoolers to have access to. Additionally, we provide targeted 12-week mentorships with high schoolers that are gearing up to pursue some sort of higher education. These students are matched with undergraduates pursuing similar careers in various universities to work on their career development skills. For example, here are some of the schools and foundations that we've worked with. So we've mentioned the word unconventional STEM a lot, but what does it mean? We define unconventional STEM as non-traditional and interdisciplinary pathways or roles that are best taught through experiences and discussions. Oftentimes, students are taught about the most traditional careers and the most traditional pathways to get to those careers. These are professions like doctors and engineers, but there are many careers that fall in between the main ones that we learn about. Here's an example. The path to becoming a doctor is generally linear. Some would typically, would, someone would typically go from high school to college for a bachelor's degree and then to medical school. But if someone's interested in research and wants to explore that field a little bit more before going to medical school, maybe their career path would look something like this, where the student would go from high school to college to a PhD program and then to medical school. Or maybe if a student is interested in the medical fields, but they aren't too sure about how to afford college, maybe that student's career pathway would look like this, where the student would work as an EMT to pay for night classes, to get a bachelor's degree, and then would attend a graduate school to get a doctorate in physical therapy. Maybe that student doesn't want to attend a four-year college, so maybe that student's career path would look more like this where they would work a typical admin job for an undergraduate night course for two years to get an associate's degree and then attend a physician's assistant program. In our, ex in our experience, these are the kinds of careers and career pathways that we have found our students didn't even know existed. Our goal at Lyra is to introduce the diversity of the STEM field to these students so that we can help them find their career niches. With 36 workshops and 15 mentorships and internships under our belt, our team has already shown success, engagement, and demand for unconventional STEM within New Jersey. Our success is furthered by an average rating of 4.7 out of 5 by students we have presented to thus far based on surveys given post-presentation. With the backing of a grant received from the NJIT Honors College, our team at Lyra is working to continuously improve our workshops to help deliver this important information as effectively as possible. Our target population are high school STEM coordinators in low-income communities. In many schools, these coordinators' jobs are to provide their students with valuable special events or programs. They know the knowledge base that their students have and the knowledge base that their students are lacking, so we can customize our workshops to their students' needs. Our target users include high school students. Based on our experiences, these are the students that have an interest in STEM careers but have fewer access to resources to pursue them. These are students that lack the STEM knowledge that we take for granted, things like scientific information on COVID-19 or the vaccines that are being distributed for it. Secondary population segments that we reach out to also include guest speakers, undergraduate mentors, and collaborators for special programs. My name is Gina Kataria. I'm a junior studying biomedical engineering, applied mathematics, and pre-medical sciences. My co-founder is Kamia Patel. She is also a junior studying biomedical engineering and business. And our vice president is Varun Pai. He's a junior studying biology, chemistry, history, and pre-medical sciences. Collectively, we are a team of dedicated students who understand how difficult it is to make these career decisions. We bring a sense of relatability and teamwork that only makes our program better and our mission stronger. However, we know that we are just three undergraduate students and we aren't experts in all of the topics that we speak about in our workshops. To help combat this issue, we invite guest speakers to deliver their expertise to our students, which is a perfect transition into what we're asking you all here today. We want to use this opportunity to call for volunteers who have a passion for STEM education and community involvement in any capacity, 
whether it be as a guest speaker, a mentor, or a special, special initiative collaborator. As always, we're also looking for donors and sponsors to help us keep this program free to the public schools that we're targeting. If you have any interest, questions, or concerns, please email us and give us a follow on social media. Thank you all for listening. I'm Joey Flanagan, co-founder and CTO of WellHerd. So millions of young adults are entering the workforce and cannot cope with the mental health issues that come with it. In fact, 76% believe their company should be doing more to support them. And 75% of all mental health issues begin around the age of 24. On top of that, access to therapy is limited to severe cases of mental health issues or high income. So our solution reduces barriers to care through on-demand access to counseling at a modest cost. It's a web app and Chrome extension powered by an AI server chatbot. The app will mainly be used to provide cognitive behavioral therapy utilizing its chatbot feature alongside its other supporting features. It can also be used alongside traditional therapy depending on the user's mental health issues and the severity of them. So our remaining milestones are the mock-ups which are due in December of 2021, our prototype, which will be done at the end of January 2022, and the app itself, which will launch sometime in May of 2022. So who are we? We are the right team consisting of my, myself, a professional with a Bachelor of Science degree in Computer Science and Experience in Applications Development, and our CEO, Allison Aglo, who has a great amount of experience in UX UI design and a Bachelor's degree in Human Computer Interaction. We also have access to a wide variety of mentors, some with experience as a startup, some mentoring other startups, and even some in the mental health field. So our market is here, and here are the details of it. 51 million adults in the United States have mental health issues. If they spend the average cost of $7,800 per year, that equals $401 billion total. Young adults, on the other hand, 8 million of them have mental health issues. And if they were to spend that same $7,800 per year, that would equal $61 billion per year. Now, out of that 8 million, 65% have mental health issues, but they don't get any help at all. If they were to get help and spend that average cost of $7,800, that would be $39 billion. So how do we plan to enter this $39 billion market? Well, we plan to continuously get information about mental health and opinions on our app and take that to mid to big size companies and use that to explain to them as to why they need this. We've already interviewed a decent amount of people and they've said things along the lines of, I think everyone should use therapy or some form of counseling. Or I think access to therapy or counsel I think making access to therapy or counseling easier is the key to helping with mental health issues. So here's our revenue model. We will sell our application to businesses as a monthly subscription per license with different tiers. So the lowest tier being $1 per license per month with standard features. The second tier being $5 per license per month with more features unlocked. And the top tier, $7 per license per month with all the features unlocked. So now who are our competitors? Well, as shown in this graph, our only real competition are apps with a chat feature via voice or text. Apps like Cerebral and BetterHelp are extremely expensive, and they have been known to have a problem matching the client with the therapist in terms of personality. Sanvelo, on the other hand, is not really too expensive, but their coaching feature that they used, where you can message a coach back and forth via text, has one problem. The coach only responds at the earliest to whatever messages you will send the next business day. Talkspace is less expensive than BetterHelp or Cerebral, as it takes some forms of insurance, some healthcare plans. However, their main problem is with their ethics. From time to time, they may use customer information for new and unanticipated uses not previously disclosed 
in our privacy, in their privacy notice. Well heard, on the other hand, due to the nature of it, we are more accessible and less expensive, which gives us our own corner of the market to carve out. So why now? Well, the younger generation's mental health is only getting worse. And with more of them entering the workforce and more of the older generations retiring, ensuring that the younger generations are competent and productive employees is becoming a bigger and bigger issue, especially now with the COVID-19 global pandemic still in effect. For anyone that wants to know more, please feel free to reach out to us. Here's our contact info. Thank you very much. My name is Mina Gerges, CEO and founder of Peak. So let's say you own or run a park like Busch Gardens. You're in a special situation where you're in competition with giants like Disney and Universal and similar sized parks like Six Flags. In order to generate more revenue, you can't increase price tickets as you will lose customers and competitors, but you also want to create an experience equivalent to Disney but don't have the resources to do so. After talking to some of the biggest Companies like Disney and Universal and, and Bush Gardens, this is what I found. Entertainment venues, such as music parks, stadiums, and arcades and festivals, are more than just an entry ticket. Only 50% of an, entertainment, of an entertainment venue's revenue is just tickets. The rest comes from merchandise, food, beverages, and services. They keep their ticket prices down to maintain competitiveness with other places, that's fine, but they need to recoup revenue through experiences within the venue. And all entertainment venues are working to build innovative experiences to engage, target, and sell to their customers, but not everyone has access to a Disney Imagineering department. Which is why I built Peak. Peak is an augmented reality startup for in-person entertainment businesses such as amusement parks, boardwalks, stadiums, and museums. Peak was built to make the experience immersive by creating a guided experience where a user can point their phone and see an overlay of augmented reality displays of their current surroundings. Unlike the current alternative of in-venue marketing, our product creates an enhanced experience placing curated information based on, based on each user's interests on 3D cards in a virtual space. And we are planning to, bat, to tackle both sides of the market. For our enterprise clients, we are fully aware that they probably have their own app. So we'll have a standard development kit or SDK so they can import it into their current existing app. For our smaller clients who might not have the resources to have their own app, they can join our centrally managed app that we create. This app will be available on the App Store free to download and how it's gonna work is that the app will recognize your location and that you're at a location that's on the peak network and it will display that information. Both sides will have the same features and both sides will have the same levels of customization. So how it's gonna look like. Let's say you're walking down Main Street USA at Walt Disney World Magic Kingdom in Orlando, Florida. Here, Disney will be able to bring the park to life. As Peak learns more about you, it'll be able to make better suggestions. So in this example, we know the user has a younger daughter. So we suggested that the mini ears on, on two feet, 10 feet away have a sale and they're only 30 bucks. And the Cinderella Castle is just up ahead where if they want to take pictures. And every customer and user will see that will see basic information such as guest relations and bathrooms. The in-person entertainment industry is about $74 billion, with an augmented reality potential of $21 billion. To put that in perspective, the augmented reality market is projected to hit $300 billion by the year of 2024. With our go-to-market plan, we plan to capture a $60 million opportunity. We plan to charge these venues. 
a, a monthly subscription based off several key factors, such as size, volume, and the platform of the choosing. Our current competition are 2D paper maps, 2D in-app maps, and in-park directories. With the help of our team of Catherine Savalas, Program Director at Alpha Labs and Marketing Operations Strategy Consultant, and Chelsea Sampson, Founder and CEO of Bikes Oro, an Integrated Digital Strategy Manager, and Will Lutz, CEO and Co-Founder of Connect With and Force Owl, we plan to come to a museum, boardwalk, or park near you. Thank you so much for listening, and you can contact me at mgurgis.10 at gmail.com. Hey, I'm Darshil Sandesera, and this is Legalese. We're revolutionizing the legal landscape with Scalable AI. Before I tell you what this is all about, let's go over the journey that I took to get to this place. It all started with me trying to build a legal document analyzer for lawyers. And to prove this, if this was actually a need, I interviewed a bunch of lawyers. And guess what? They don't like hearing the word AI at all. So just don't do that if you're ever going to do it. Eventually, I realized there was no market there. So I decided to pivot to the original idea, which was a terms and conditions reader and after repeating the same process over again, I hit a brick wall. Now at this point, I kept hitting dead ends on dead ends and I was pretty demotivated and didn't know what to do. That was until uh, I overheard fellow founders, Asta and Parth, who were describing the nightmare they were having about their lease and how much regret they had about not understanding their lease when they signed it. I had my golden goose. Why not merge the two previous ideas into one and create a legal document review platform for consumers? Then after this, to prove the concept, I decided to interview a bunch of previous renters, but one particular sector of those renters was facing this problem the most. It was international students. International students would love to get their leases reviewed, but traditional lawyers are expensive and charge hundreds of dollars an hour, something that students in general just can't afford. This not only is a loss to students, but also hurts the lawyer's bottom line. And unfortunately, there's no affordable way right now to solve this dilemma. That is until we came along. Legalese, at Legalese, we offer a cheap and efficient way to get legal support. This not only saves international students money, but also adds to the bottom line for lawyers as well. Here's how it works. The international students uploads their document to our platform. Our AI quickly scans through the document, prepping it for the lawyer, who then reviews it in record time. Once the review is done, the student gets an alert and is now equipped with the legal knowledge he or she needs. Now you're probably thinking, involving a lawyer every time, this is definitely not scalable at all. Here's why you're wrong. In the beginning, as our AI is learning, the lawyer might have to do a lot of the heavy lifting, which means that he or she might only be able to review like four contracts in a billable hour. But with time, as our AI improves, the lawyer will have to put in less and less effort resulting in them being able to review much more contracts in an hour. This is great for us because the hourly rate for the lawyer won't change that much, but our revenue is going to increase exponentially. But is there even a market for this? Every year, $256 billion are spent on legal services in the U.S. Out of that, international students account for $8 billion spent. Our marketing strategy is for the top 60 school international student schools, and that is a $90 million market. So the age-old question, how do we even make money? Simple, we charge $50 per contract review. By doing this over time as our AI matures, our costs will go down and our revenue is gonna increase significantly and our lawyers will become more efficient as a result. To aid in the process of increasing our revenues, we're gonna look to secure key partnerships with many of the top 60 schools and various international student advocacy groups within them. Along with this, we also plan to implement the traditional marketing avenues such as content-driven marketing on YouTube, as well as Google Ads and using social media groups to spread awareness like Reddit or Facebook. 
So far, I've said a lot of great things about legalese, but how do we compare to our competition? As you can see, we're not only faster, but we're also much more customer focused than the other guys are. Our closest competitor, Legal Shield, is similar in speed to us, but requires a monthly subscription to access its services, something that students in general would just never do. While LegalZoom and Rocket Lawyer are similar in terms of monthly subscriptions, they're much more focused on small and medium businesses. This left a giant hole in the market for us to step in and fill, creating a fast, efficient company that is solely customer focused. So who's on our team? I'm Darshil Sandesara, the founder. I'm a two startup veteran who has a ton of experience getting customers and building out products. Along with this, I have degrees in electrical and mechanical engineering with over 10 years of sales experience. Now our advisory board is, uh, consists of Will Lutz, the general manager of NJII, a season, and also a seasoned startup veteran. We also have Kat Savalas, the program director at NJII, who has over 10 plus years of uh, leading startup communities. And finally, we have Chelsea Samuelson, the director of growth at NJII, and a multi-talented individual who's worked at six early stage startups. So what's next? We're currently looking for lawyers to partner with us. So if you know anyone, let us know. And after that, we plan to launch. Thank you for your time. If you have any questions, I'll be available after the event or via email. And if you're interested in checking us out, feel free to scan the QR code. Thank you. Whew. That was awesome. That was phenomenal. Great work to all of our teams. Don't forget about us when you're rich and famous. Thank you to everyone for joining us. And again, thanks to our members and supporters with an extra thanks to Will and Chelsea for all their time and energy. If you'd like to learn more about Highlander Foundry, VentureLink, or NGII, feel free to reach out to us at venturelink at ngit.edu. All right, we'll see you next year. We owe a very special thanks to Joshua Bleeker. Joshy, you're the best AV engineer ever, and we couldn't have done it without you, man.